Welcome to another episode of the BTCC Roundup Show, which is uh, very exciting after a very exciting Thruxton weekend. Thruxton's always hard work for the drivers and the teams, but um, we've got a man who seemed to sort of make easy make easy work of it this weekend. We're with Dan Camish, who races for the Napa Racing Touring Car Team, which is obviously involved, uh, backed technically involved with with Motorbase. It all gets a bit confusing when they're like that, but that, that's basically, I think I've got it right, Dan, haven't I? Something like that. You've probably worked on saying the name over and over again. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, but a fantastic weekend. And also rounded off a fantastic round of points, worked brilliantly for the team, which we can mm-hmm. talk about during, during our chat, but also that... Um, voted by the btcc app users as driver of the day which is always nice because you, you never do know do you as a driver if anybody really cares and yeah. and actually drivers are we're all a bit needy aren't we at any point so it's always quite Absolutely. nice that somebody somebody appreciates you anyway so that's, no, great. that's very but, I mean, a, a very good couple of days at thruxton really and uh, a big step forward because where, where did you qualify when we went to thruxton earlier in the year it wasn't quite as, strong uh, as that. well third actually Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah that's right. I just, that's right. I just, oh, that's right. You had a collision just, on the first yeah, lap. Yeah, I just didn't make it around the first lap. So, um, <laughs> kind of put, you know, spoiled the weekend from there. It's, it's, it's become really difficult this year. I think that's one of the big differences I found this year is the days are coming from the back to the front, you know, when you've got less weight or yeah. uh, maybe a soft a soft tyre. It's just gone. Um, it's so difficult now to, to move through the field. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of the – I mean, I actually – I wasn't a huge fan of the hybrid thing, but that's when I was a team boss. Now I don't have to pay for it. I I, I actually quite like it because it puts the driver more in charge of how they can manage their their success ballast, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do agree with you. I think actually, and I think possibly it will change next year. I think they're just having a year just to get it a year under their belts, if you like, for yeah. Toka. But it is to actually have it so you don't have any. If you're at the front, you don't have any laps of, of boost mm. and then you have one if you're second two if you're third and down to 10th place and then after that it's a free for when everybody gets it and i think that would actually make a difference i think that would yeah. probably get it but again nobody knew that at the start of the year because they worked it out i think they worked it out mathematically of how it would affect everybody over different lengths of lap and all that sort of stuff yeah but i think they may be maybe maybe they got too many engineers involved and too many calculators and didn't quite get it right but but you know at, at the end of the day you know as, as we've said before in this program you know motorsport has got to be and also seem to be uh better for the planet you know it, it can, can can never improve what's happening but at least it can reduce its footprint if you like but okay. so, I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on hybrid? I mean, that's, that's the key thing. Um, similar to yourself, I think initially I was I was a, f- a fan of it and I thought this is really going to suit me and, and, and how I go about my racing. If you look back at, we were talking about Matt and his stats, I think as a, I think I've had something like the second or third best qualifying average pretty much every year that I've been in touring cars. Um, my plan is always to start at the front and stay at the front. I always find that so much easier way to go racing. Um, and I thought, to be honest, that the hybrid had really helped me do that. Um, and I think once, once now I'm starting to get there with a the car, I think it, it will work out that way because you do see that the same guys t- t- tend to qualify towards the front. You know, it's the days of sort of having loads of weight in and qualifying in the mid pack. The, the top guys seem to be at a week in, week out, keep it in the top 10. Um, so I expected that to really help me. Um, I found in the racing, you're right in what you're saying, the fact that we have, even the guys at the front may have eight or nine laps to use. You know, if, if you're the race leader, you might still have eight laps out of 15. It's not quite making a big enough difference, I don't think. Um, we all use it in the same place in the races. It kind of counteracts. I think we do need to see bigger disparity. Um, and like you said, people worked it out, you know, the, the, the powers that be sat down and, and did, did the maths. And I think it's just a little bit out this year, but I'm sure there'll be a correction coming in the new year for um, how powerful it can be. Um, maybe it can maybe it can be turned up a little bit as well once we've now proved its reliability. Um, and I think you'll start to see it having a much bigger impact over the years to come, um, especially if we can start to introduce back, you know, the, the option tyre and other things. So it's very much been a toe in the water year, but uh, I think it's been a successful one. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, what, when you say just then, where you were sort of part of the track, I mean, is that a, a process that you sort of develop over the whole weekend, or is there a plan before? There's certainly so there is a plan to it. 
Um, you know, we have uh, Tony uh, Carozza, who's Ashley's mm. main engineer. Um, I think he has a little bit of a sort of a, uh, a computer program, as it were, that basically he puts in the data and it spits out the numbers and uh, we can kind of try and figure out what might be the best place to use it. But to be honest, um, as a racing driver, you can, because we know how the system works, um, you can kind of look at a map and you can pretty much say, mm. I, bet it's, I bet it's best used there, there and there. And mm. 99 times out of 100, you'd be absolutely bang on. Um, so yeah. everyone's kind of getting to the set. Everyone figured that out pretty quickly. Um, so we kind of stopped doing that quite early on. Um, we started with this idea of, right, we'll try and copy what the, the model tells us and then very quickly realized, well, it's exactly where I would have pressed it anyway. Um, so from, to be honest, it's, it's, it, it's not maybe as difficult as that bit made out. Um, you know, the circuits themselves lend it. You, you can see when you look at the circuit, this is going to be the key places. Um, and everyone works that out pretty quickly for themselves. So. so then going back a little bit, you know, you had a great weekend at, at Thruxton, but going back a bit, I mean, uh, people will be surprised that I actually do a little bit of homework when I when I do these programmes. I remember 2013, which was a stellar year for you, because you won 24 of the 24 races that you raced in Formula Ford, and everybody was going about Dan Kamish and what well, great job he's doing and all that sort of stuff, um, which is always nice. And the... The th I suppose the, I suppose the thing is, guys who are on the single seater route, they're always looking. Oh, it's, we're going to Formula One, and that's what you think you're going to do. And but actually, I was surprised that I read back some some interviews and articles. But while you were doing Formula Ford, you were already planning to try and make the step to British touring cars the following year. Yeah, I was when I won the championship in 2013. I uh, part of the prize was the Airwaves uh, motor base test. So. The first touring car I ever got to drive was the was the motor base Focus, which was uh, which is nice in a way now, sort of coming back to back to the team, um, having been and I think it was Ashley's first taste of it as well. I think he also got the prize the year after me. So um, no, I mean, I, a long you know, trying to cut to cut the story down. I was actually never probably really going to go car racing at all. I was karting in Europe in two thousand and eight. I was enjoying my karting. I was reasonably successful um and in 2009 i was trying to join a different team in the paddock and they took one look at me and just said you are way too tall for us yeah. like you, you're just too tall like we think you've, you've you've got the talent for it but you're just you're just too tall for, for how both. tall are you are you like six, six three six, six, six two i am yeah six uh, two okay but there's a reason that a lot of the top european kart racers are like okay. jockey size um and they just said, look, it's just too difficult um, and you're not for us. And we sort of thought, oh, well, do we really want another year racing against these guys? If I can't be in the team, um, what else can we have a look at? And I went to have a, a bit of a go in a Formula Ford and enjoyed it. Um, and that was it as plans were sort of laid to go Formula Ford racing. Turns out I did quite successfully in my first year, had some uh, podiums and even a pole position on my second attempt. So we had a really good start. And then you know yeah of course formula one is on i think it should be on every young driver's agenda of course it should but you quickly realize what your limitations might be um i had a bit of sponsorship but i wasn't from a wealthy background and you know we've quickly realized that formula one wasn't where i was gonna if i was gonna have a career it certainly wasn't gonna be there um and you know i was lucky enough to race on the toka package from you know quite early on um sort of back in what well, we've been 2012 when i was racing formula renault um, and you just, when you see how big the Toka package is and the touring car package in general, if you're going to race anywhere in the UK, there's only one place to do it, and that is in British touring cars. Um, and a few years later, obviously, I got my opportunity, which is which has been great. But I, I, I was always quite realistic about my racing. I did have that, you know, there was a time when I was off doing something different. You know, I did the GT type stuff, you know, successful Porsche racer, and then. I kind of hoped that my my GT opportunity would come, but it never did. Um, you know, no, despite no matter how Porsche race, many Porsche races I won, um, no GT team ever picked the phone up and said, "Do you fancy having a go in our our GT car?" Um, which kind of just shows you that that unfortunately that's that is modern motorsport. But Matt Neal did pick the phone up and and wanted to interview me about the Honda job, um, which was fantastic. And obviously, I jumped at it when I got the chance, and that's why my career kind of diverged from the GT stuff towards the uh, the touring car stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, because you were. I, I mean, if, I can just, if I could just yeah. come in there a minute, Sean. I yeah, mean, it's going to be some of the the younger fans watching who maybe weren't in the in the paddock watching when Dan was racing in Formula Ford to really appreciate how successful that season was. I mean, I remember that that year feeling a bit sorry for Nick Carter, the guy who was doing the series PR at the time, because. There's only so many times you can do a headline on a website that says Dan Camish wins. I think it was getting a bit tough for him by the end of the year. But I mean, you said it was a 100% win record before Dan called time on on his program when the championship was won. But you know, he didn't finish a lap all season lower than second place. Um, I think during his time racing, he led something like 96% of the laps out front. Um, it was round 11 of the season before anyone else got to lead a lap. Um, so, I mean, you can't really get much more dominant than that. I mean, in a weird way, how was that for you as a driver, Dan? Because, you know, when you're dominating to such an extent, yeah. is it hard sometimes, as, as stupid as it sounds, to kind of keep the motivation up? 100%. 100%. 100% it's, not, um, it's, it's not a good position to find yourself in as a driver in many ways, because unfortunately when you are that dominant, um, people naturally look to the opposition and say, well, Maybe they're just, who are you beating? Maybe they're just not very good. Um, and, and that's a shame for those guys as well, because actually some of them were good. I was just at a different time in my career. You know, my Formula Ford career started in 2009. I raced people like Joseph Newgarden um, and James Cole and Scott Malvin and people that were really, really good. And um, I ended up, obviously, I did the Renault bit in 2012 and was successful against Oliver Rowland and Alex Lynn and Jack Hawksworth and all these guys that went on to have mega careers. And then it, when I got injured in 2012, uh, we didn't know what to do um, for, for 13. And Formula Ford was going through that transition into a new era. And um, JTR, Joe Tandy Racing and Nick sort of said, why do you kind of go like this? And it was just at the time of the EcoBoost engine with Mountune, who obviously now power my Ford Focus. And I drove some good races, don't get me wrong, but also, you know, we were just far and away had an advantage that year. Um, and the problem with that is that even sometimes when I won races by the skin of my teeth, uh, I think there was one race at Rockingham where I battled all race with Jay Kruger. Um, and that was a really tough waste race to win, actually. It wasn't easy at all. That was a really tough one. But still the headline said, kind of, Camish wins again. And it's like, actually, that's not how it played out. Um, you know, that, so it started to diminish myself as well. You know, no matter how well I did, it actually didn't come across anymore. So that was part of the reason we chose to get out of it when we did. It wasn't just about saving the last little bit of money and, and getting out when we could. It was also, this is probably now been detrimental to me, really. Um, once I'd won that much, it was, it was time to leave it alone. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned there because I, I didn't know about this. You, you said you you got injured in 2012. I didn't know about that. What, what, what was that? Yeah, what yeah. So 2000, I think it was 2011. I raced. Uh, get my years mixed up. It seems a long time ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. 2011 yeah. Formula, was Formula Renault UK, and that was with Mark Bedet. Uh, Mark was great. He really helped me out. Um, we had nothing like the money to do it, but Mark was keen to give me my chance. And uh, I think I did six rounds that year. Um, and that was the years that, you know, Fortec were sort of dominant with Oliver mm. Rowland and Alex Lane. And uh, I had Hawks, Hawks up as a teammate, uh, also another Yorkshire lad. Um, there were some really good guys in it. Um, and it, I did well. I had three podiums, I think, in the last three races and uh, did well, did very well. And then 2012, again, you know, like many young careers, they kind of come to a bit of a halt. You know, where are you going to find the money from to, to go again? What What's out there? What can you pick up? And I had last minute offer to go do a Euro Cup race with, uh, I think it was ATEC GP. Um, mm. And we had nothing but issues all weekend and um, just with sort of prep and different problems. And I got to the track um, having never sort of not sit in a car since the end of last season, all very underprepared for European racing. Um, but that's the kind of thing you do when you're sort of trying to make a name for yourself on limited budget. And um I basically just end up being speared by a flying car. Um, and it, it fra I got a fractured pelvis from that. Um, oh. So I was in hospital overnight and then released and basically spent a couple of months laying in, laying down in bed. Um, and that was my full season of, of 2012 was over at that point. Um, I've actually got the, I've got the pictures. I'll send, I can send them over if you want to put screenshots up if you, when, when this goes out, but um, yeah. quite, it, it was an incredibly violent accident because even though I was, 
okay. I mean, I, I got out of the car, sort of crawled to the side, and I was in massive amounts of pain. Um, I've done two things. One, I'd, I'd, I'd whacked my knees together uh, mm. about as hard as you could before sort of shattering your kneecaps. I'd, I'd give them such a hard hit. Um, and the second thing was in some of the pictures, a guy contacted me actually in hospital. He said, I've got some pictures if you want to see them. He said, but I'm not sure you do because they're a little bit, you're going to see how close this was. Um, and you can see that I put my hand up as the wheel passes over my head. It literally like oh, wow. another two inches lower and the wheel would have hit me in the head and I probably wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, and it's that sort of, and this car was out of control, well out of control long before it hit me. It does make you wonder why it went in such a direction and why I got away with it that day. Um, so that that was, yeah, a shame that happened. But also, uh, obviously, I came back from it and, and had a good career since. But it was a it was a, certainly an eye opening and thought provoking incident. Yeah, well, it definitely makes you think. Shame, I mean, shame because of the calibre of drive you'd have been up against that season as well. Because Euro Cup that year, I think there was De Vries, Van Dorn, yeah. Ocon. You know, guys who've gone on to Formula One. I mean, you say there you were looking at touring cars and sports car route, but you know, you never know if you'd beaten those kind of guys where your career could have gone. Yeah, I think at the time I was probably a little bit off beating those guys. Like they were so well prepared in, in uh, obviously in, in very um, yeah no pre appreciate the uh, positivity there, but yeah they were you know coming at it from a different angle you know massively well prepared and, and and on their way up and i was sort of scrambling my, my dad always wanted me to have a once we my dad's never done motorsport he's just a fan of motorsport and um i think he always wanted me to get to formula one i had aspirations around the single seater stuff he wanted me to do it um which is why we kind of stuck at it what bill boy don't know about me is that i didn't even sit in a racing car till i was 20 years old um you know when you think max verstappen was in f1 at 17 even late 16s it might have been. So I was already kind of getting on a bit in, in racing terms by the time I even sat in a racing car. So um, it was good that I had that grounding in single seaters. I, I enjoyed it. You learn a lot. Um, but for sure, my destiny was always going to be with a roof over my head. And I guess in a roundabout where you did get to Formula One, it just wasn't in the Formula One cars. It was on the sport package. So you did yeah. make it in the end. And it was without question the most incredible thing um, uh, you know I've ever, ever done. Um, as much as I enjoy the, the touring car stuff, and it is fantastic, and it's it's amazing to be the main the, the you're not a support when you're a touring car, you know, when you're in British touring cars, you are the main show, and that's 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 what sets it apart. But even being a support package in Super Cup, you know, the the practice was at seven o'clock on a night. You get one practice, one qualifying, and one race. But that one race just so happens to be at like twelve in the afternoon, the last race before Formula One starts on a Sunday. And uh, there's nothing like that, you know, being on a basically an F1 grid um, when the fans are pretty much all in the stands. And, uh, you know, whether it's your home race or, you know, Monaco, I was I was on the podium. Yeah, they're memories that are just with me forever. See, I'm surprised with that sort of career that the GT, the GT side of things didn't didn't take off or at least even a proper go, especially as you, as you did the year in the GT4 Porsche. You thought they would have been something going on that would that would drag you in why why do you have you got do you got any reasons for that do you think or, or i think if i didn't know things? you know what if i was i saw there was a matt might know a bit, a bit about this there was a, a a bit of an, a bit of a to do a few months ago about an aston martin driver who got told said he was a works driver and then got called up about his silver rating and gold pairing and all this sort of problem and my problem was as soon as i won the porsche championship for the first time i was a gold gold um rated driver oh, yeah. and now there's no difference between having me and having a full a full factory guy yeah, yeah yeah so people that i actually beat ended up having much better opportunities than i ever got because they needed silver they were silver yeah, yeah. yeah. and and it, so if someone had said to me dan you're gonna actually you're better off not winning this championship if you want if you if you ever want to get back to Le Mans again you're better mm. off you're better yeah. off not doing as well as you are and you know i've been gold ever since and um it's a shame that the system kind of it's kind of broken in that respect. You know, you 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 want a successful career, but actually, you can do yourself a bit of a disservice in the short term. You know, unfortunately, I, I, I said before, I, I don't come from from wealth, so any sponsorship I had, and when I talk about sponsorship I had, we're talking ten grand here, ten grand there, a lot of money to the uh, to you know in normal terms, but 
in motor racing terms, it's a drop in the ocean. So any opportunity I was going to get from a G team, I, I needed somebody to say, look, we think you're good enough. Come and drive this and, and you won't see a bill at the end of it. And unfortunately, there's very few opportunities like that around. And if you are going to get them, they kind of want you to come in as a silver and then they, you know, they keep hold of you as it goes on. Um, that opportunity just didn't come my way. Um, I, I wanted, you know, my, my obviously my aspiration was to get into the Porsche program. But uh, when I won, uh, Matt mentioned about me not finishing lower than second in Formula Ford. I actually did exactly the same thing in 2015. I did 16 Carrera Cup races and never finished lower than second. And I won 11 of them. Um, I basically just rewrote the book on, on that. And um, when in Porsche did the junior shootout they do every year, uh, I was 25 at the time. And the cutoff was 24. And they didn't make an exception to put me in. And I thought that was that was when I realized maybe I'm just, it's not going to happen for me, you know. Um, it just, it was a shame. But, uh, you know, when, when you miss out by a year, from being part of some of these junior scholarships that might have taken my career in a completely different direction. Um, but equally, having when I look back, you know, I've had a fantastic career and I've got a lot to be proud of and very happy that I get to sit here and talk to you guys as a, you know, basically what is a, a factory touring car driver in the old fashioned sense is, uh, is well, amazing. Right. Well, that's, I mean, I was just about to say, actually, it's great for us that, that actually sort of a, 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 a driver who's sort of seemed to be on the sort of the mainstream single seater route to, to Formula One stardom, if you like, with Formula One, because there's a lot of the names you said there have got to Formula One or and then also any cars as cars. Because that I, I think the British touring car grid, if it, you could take a, a good chunk of that grid, 50%, maybe two thirds, who who could who could win races really, you know, in 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 most of the cars on there. So it shows you how competitive it is. And it shows you the teams. I mean there's a, a, Fair play to, to, to Motorbase and Napa Racing because they've got really, I would say, two of the best drivers on the grid. In it. And they really, I think teams have started to, they've always realised it, but I think they spend lots of money on tyres and engines and chassis and this, that and the other. And they sometimes forget that the squidgy bit in the middle is actually the thing that makes it work. Because you can have the best car you like with the best engineers and all that sort of stuff. But if the driver isn't up to it, they're not up to it, are they? Mm-hmm. They're going to be at the back. So I think it's great that that the series is definitely it's driver focused. I think the driver can make a big difference to to where you finish in the races. Agreed. Yeah, the driver makes a, a heck of a difference. You know, I think motorsport is always a team game. You know, it is mm-hmm. a team sport. You know, okay, where the the driver's the one in it at the end of the day, and 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 the one maybe that the last piece of that puzzle. But it's such a team sport, and. Um, yeah, you know, there's some real strong teams out there, some real strong drivers and driver pairings. Um, I mean, Ash is an example. Um, Ash, Ash, in my opinion, would win in just about anything he turned his hand yeah. to. He's yeah. that good. Um, you know, he the, like myself, the reason that he's probably not off racing a GT car and winning Le Mans is because, well, that opportunity wasn't the hand he was dealt. But he's he's good enough. Don't, don't underestimate how good he is. And there's a oh, few yeah. guys like that, you know, they've... They're, they're, they're in touring cars because it's it's their career and it works for them. Um, you know, I think I think there are opportunities to do other things, but then you step back and you think, well, I get to drive my own car. There's not many places anymore where you get to drive your own car. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of driver sharing that goes on nowadays, but to have your own team in your own car built around you in a series where things do get built around you um, – in front of a fantastic fan base um, and a huge TV audience that's basically can make you like Jason Plato or Matt Neal, household names in the UK, uh, if you get it right. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, there's not many places better to be, I don't think. So going back to this year now, I would have said, you know, the start of the year, I, I would have said that you and Ash were definitely two of the names that people were touting could be winning the championship. Um, but again, you had a, a you had the car catch fire, uh, mm-hmm. which was pretty spectacular. I think the, the, the most impressive pit is that you, you managed to try and find a fire extinguisher at the time while there was, which you couldn't actually see where you're going possibly is when you decide it's time to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, but that but that sort of really set you back. I, it, I, I seem to think it set you back a little bit at the start of the year. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's not. We had such good viability in the in the run up to the to the year, and um, you know, we were we were full of confidence that we were going to be somewhere in the mix. Um, 
and then yeah, to have the failure within on the first flying lap. And you're absolutely right. I when when the car was moving at speed and the, the flames, I realised I was on fire. But when you're at speed, the flames kind of get licked away, and it, it you know no sort of sense of urgency at that point. I just thought, right, I'll get it parked. Where's the marshal? There he is. I'll head for him. Uh, but it's as the speed comes off and I got stuck into the gravel that suddenly just engulfed the front of the car. And like you say, I could no longer see out the windshield for, for flames and, and smoke. And then the smoke punches through the bulkhead. And um, that sort of 10 seconds earlier or five seconds earlier when I had a bit of calm and clarity suddenly was just get out, get get out of the car. Yeah, and you're right. you just kind of instinct to just throw your belts off and throw yourself out the door. Um, and looking back, I just think, ah, oh, I should have. What I should have done is turn the master switch on as when I still had the clarity to be looking for where to park. Um, you know, because it was a fuel fire and it was in the high pressure hose. I mean, ultimately, it was such a tiny nick in the hose, it probably would have stayed under pressure for quite a while anyway. So I'm not sure how much it would have helped, but um. Yeah, you know, fair play to the, to the marshals to get into it as quick as they did, and it raged for a good while. You know, it was it was hard to get out, um, and it's not how you want to start a season. You know, the guys have already worked so hard. The guys are tired from you know the testing we've done and, and getting these cars absolutely tip top ready for the season. Because not just our two, but the the two on the other side as well, like you said, from motor base to sport. Um, and then you've got a complete sort of engine bay fire reassembly overnight the guys worked really hard and off we went but it did put us on the back foot um well i was really impressed to be honest because my first my first thoughts was that you wouldn't be out the next day looking mm -hmm. at that fire but then when it was ready the next morning so you know fair play to the guys now and i know rob tickner pretty well the team manager mm -hmm. um because he was my team manager for quite a few years but they they did a brilliant job i mean i i, I, I hats off to them you know they did an absolutely fantastic job uh to get you out there and that's that's what you've got to be in it to win it because then you're fine. you didn't score a lot of points the next day but you scored a few you know, yeah got you back in the swing of it if you like um but yeah i mean but having said that you've had you've had a few ups and downs during the year but stepping forward one thing it does help the team because you're a little bit behind ash because of the, you've had a few setbacks during the year mm -hmm. you're then in a position that you're coming on strong absolutely fully lit at thruxton pole position you know he's doing a brilliant job absolutely brilliant job but then you're in a position to be able to help Ash in the championship as well. Um, mm -hmm. How difficult was that for you to when you get the call over the radio? I presume it's something you spoke about beforehand. Yeah, we did speak about it beforehand, and um, you know, it was I knew it was coming. You know, we, we'd sort of been speaking about it in not in serious terms, but I was always open. I, I knew that my year had fallen away pretty quickly. Um, it, it wasn't going to be my year, um, and, and there's times where we've had bad luck, and it has been genuine bad luck. Uh, the fire is not is no one's fault, and certainly out of my control. Um, we had incidents at Croft that you couldn't, you know, a tire spun on the rim. I mean, no one's heard of that in years, and it put me in the wall. Um, we've had some bad luck. We've also had some times where we just haven't been quick enough, and that's that's not luck. That's just me and my new engineer James. Um, you know, we have to go through that phase where you, you learn what what I need. I learn what he needs from me to in order to get the best out of the car. And it's taken us a while, but we're getting there now. We're starting to turn a real corner. And um, I think we turned it probably at, at, at Snetterton and then Fruxton, you really, we could really see that. So you're right. I, I think we're going to have a real strong end to the season. But ultimately, you know, my challenge for a title ended a while ago. But like you said, I need to be at the front to help Ash. And... So I knew that my moment would, would come. Um, we sort of sat and discussed that if I was in a position to win, um, certainly the first one, that, you know, the team would be absolutely happy for me to win that. You know, I need it for myself. I need it for my guys on my car that work so hard. I think just in terms of the whole team morale, I think it helps to, you know, because there's no point having Ash up here and me, me much lower down. Like, you know, I'm happy for Ash to win, but I should be finishing second. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. there's such a disparity and, I needed that confidence and that motivation and the team did as well. So I think it was great to get the first one. And then after the first one, um, we spoke and it was like, right, if we get in a position and it's going to take uh, quite a few stars to align to give us the opportunity because you can't just roll over anywhere. You know, we've got to make sure that Ash has got a big enough gap over P3 to allow it, um, that we'll do it. And, and to be honest, most of the race of race two that I led, I, you know, Gordon was pushing Ash round and there was no opportunity. And then I think three laps to go, Gordon makes a mistake and suddenly 
cost me a win. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, it, it, the call came over the radio and it was completely the right call. You know, we spoke about it afterwards again, but it was, uh, it's never in doubt that I was going to move out of the way. You know, I, having lost this championship by two points in the past, I know how important a few points can be. And um, it was the right thing to do. Uh, and as, as the team reminded me, you know, there'll be many more opportunities, I hope, to win races. And, um, you know, it was it was the only only option in the right one. So going into the next two rounds, you've got Silverstone and then Brands Hatch. Both circuits, I think, should suit the Ford and yourself. So I think the team as a whole is looking pretty strong. I think so. I mean, I, the last time I was on, on pole at Fruxton, I was actually on pole at Silverstone just after. So I'm hopeful that I can repeat that success. I think, you know, from my side, I'm now sitting eighth in the championship, which is not a bad recovery considering how many <laughs> how many oh, yeah. points I've gone and missed this season for myself. But um, it also means I've still got a good amount of hybrid. Um, I think the car will go there, well there. You're right. I think we have turned a corner in what we need from a qualifying car to a race car. And I'd like to think that I can certainly put it somewhere at the front. And and I'm sure Ash, you know, he the same. I think he'll have a really good chance. And, you know, ultimately, if I get a chance to help Ash again, I will. Because there's no point me doing what I did at Fruxton to only to not continue. You know, otherwise I wouldn't have done it in the first place. Um, you know, race free at Fruxton, I'd already said to him, look, like, you know, I'll be well out of the way. Because if I'm going to do that in race two and then you know not do it further on it just kind of didn't make sense really so you know if I get a chance to tow Ash round in uh, in qualifying or I can I can help in some way then of course it's in in all our interest to do that so um, you know of course I want success for myself as does the team but um, you know Ash has, I think Ash has got a real chance now he's done an mm-hmm. amazing job um, the team the cars got better better and better and now we're two to go I think he's. Uh, I think he's gonna gonna be really. I think I think he might be the man to beat now. Oh, definitely, think, Matt. You had something to put in then. Yeah, I think it's good from a team perspective that the two rounds that we've got left are Silverstone and Brands because if you look through the years, the two are Dan's stronger circuits. Every time we've been to Brands Hatch Grand Prix, he's won at least one race during his time in touring cars. Um, I think he won the last time he raced at Silverstone and was on the podium as well. So, you know, there's a good, a good record there that you know, even though Brands GP was also a, a circuit that's got some bad memories for, for obvious reasons. It's one where you'd expect him to go strong and we know Motorbase a quick round there with it being a local circuit as well. Yeah, I mean, that, I was just touching on that. That was, I mean, I was staying, I could, wait, was that 2019? Is that 19 or 20? I can't remember. 19, now, yeah. 19, yeah. 19. Is that dark? Because obviously we were running Rory and, uh, you know, Sam toured off and, and yeah. then and the last ones were with Mike Bushel and stuff. And I just, it, you couldn't, you couldn't, I mean, I know it's, it, it wasn't a great, great time for you. You just couldn't make that up that day. It was unbelievable the the toing and throwing in the championship that, that in that race in particular was unbelievable. It was, it was, it was definitely, just unbelievable it's like the, the best drama you could ever see so how did you deal with all that oh yeah you know i think um i think alan owes me a beer actually for that for the, drama <laughs> that was, the drama that unfolded it was better than any any itv soap you could ever imagine wasn't it um just so yeah. you know alan, alan gal never owes anybody a beer uh, and if he tells yeah. he's gonna owe you one he never pays it <laughs> it was uh i mean it was an amazing day actually you know uh, the end of course was was sad and and, and yeah. something that um still sort of takes my breath away from time to time but mm. ultimately to win race one in the in the in the rain on slicks my teammate matt finished second on wets um it was a fantastic one too it fired us back into the championship amazing amazing memories of, of, of that of that day um and then in race two it all changes around and and suddenly i'm championship leader with one race to go you know s- about to snatch it at the death and um you know race three was people said i remember people sort of saying were well, you nervous or how do you and you know what it's weird how kind of a like a sense of calm kind of comes over. It was quite quite weird, actually. I, I don't remember sort of feeling anything other than quite calm about the whole thing. And um, I went out there and did 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 the job. And mm. 
I think, you know, I've, I've won championships in the past and I think having that mentality of knowing how to deal with that final moment is, is important. And to be honest, I don't think I did much wrong. Uh, but ultimately, from from about three laps in, I knew that I had a, had a problem. You know, the, the break was... The brake was going softer and softer. It wouldn't recover. Um, no matter how much clean air, no matter how much I tried to coast, lift and coast, the brake was just softer and softer, hotter and hotter. Um, and ultimately, it failed with one lap to go. But, I mean, it, it, yeah, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but also unavoidable. You know, I had to, to, to beat the BMWs that year, um, who, who were the strongest package. You know, they, they, at times they were so fast. Um, I, I, I was going to win by stealth. Basically, I think I had 14 podiums that year. Out of first. So basically half half the races I was on the podium. Um, and whenever they were winning, I finished third. And, and when they had a bad day, I tried to capitalise and pick up the points. And I just kept myself close enough that when they just dropped the ball at the end, I was there. But uh, I needed 100% reliability and 100% of everything to beat them and I just came up short I think that was that was my only non-point score of the whole year I think that last race um, it was the only it was the big, I think it was, I think it was the only lap I didn't finish wasn't yeah. it something yeah. like that, which is unbelievable in itself um, yeah. yeah but you know you know to do that only my second year second year in a front wheel drive car second year in a championship um, was was fantastic result and we can hold his heads high so um Ultimately, it's done me no harm. I'm, I'm still here in a great place. Um, went on and, and had a fantastic 2020, you know, finished third again and best front wheel drive for the second year in a row. Um, it's been, you know, as much as it's not my name on the uh, on the records list, I think, um, you know, a lot of people that day saw me as a deserving champion anyway. So, I mean, no, we, we spoke more than once about that weekend and kind of the aftermath of it. I mean, you said there you were you kind of came in by stealth. I think the second half of that season, including that final race, there was only six times that you weren't on the podium. Then it was that consistency that got you in. But even going to Brands Hatch, there weren't many people who probably would have said, I think Dan Camish is going to win the title. Yeah. I think everyone just assumed Colin was going to go there and wrap it up. So do you think the fact that you were the outsider and you maybe weren't going in with everyone expecting you to to win the title. It made it a bit easier to deal with than if you'd been in, say, Colin's position going into that weekend and what had happened. Oh, yeah. You'd happen. Oh, no, for sure. I mean, I went in with what have I got to lose attitude and obviously someone like Colin goes in with it, I've got everything to lose attitude and that, that's a different mentality. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think all you can do is, is deal, you know, deal the handy dealt and uh, I'll play the handy dealt and and my our race one really set us up and, and it all switched around in race two um with with Colin and Matt having a bit of a to-do uh, which everyone thought was somehow pre-planned which could never be pre-planned um you know it's just it's just one of those things um and I understand that from Colin's perspective if he'd have lost he'd have been massively disappointed by it but um you know, so, um, that sport. You know, someone someone wins and and, yeah. and someone loses. So um, it, it it was it was a great it was a great year. One I'm very proud of. And ultimately, the end result didn't go my way, but it was still a still a, a mega year and a, and a mega ending um, end to the year as well. Like I say, to have both me and Matt on the podium in race one. Um, it's not many races where the winner wins on slicks and the second place guys on wets. That's quite an unusual uh, <laughs> ending to a race. So. Uh, yeah, all good. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, so I mean, looking at these final two races, I mean, it's it's it, it's gonna. And as you said, it's so unpredictable. You just don't actually know. But what I think, it, it, I can definitely say, is going to be happening. I think Dan Camish is going to be in the mix of it. And actually, you've only got one job really, which is to you know do as well as you can, but also support your teammate. Now, mm. actually, out of everybody else, has everybody else got that? No, they haven't. So mm. it really does, you know, your you being there as well, up there at the pointy end, helping his teammate. I think is is great because obviously you got you got Jake and Colin. They're in separate teams. In effect, mm. I suppose that they will work together at some point. Um, well, but Daniel, sort of Dan Daniel. Lloyd. Say again, sorry. But you've also got to factor in that Jake and Colin are also fighting each other for the title as well. Oh, well, they, oh yes, actually, yeah, 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 yeah. I sort of thought I hadn't. I, I sort of went without that saying it. But the the I mean the other side. It'd be interesting to see how Dan Lloyd goes and see because he's been had a little bit of an inconsistent year. It'd be interesting to see if he can get up and help um, 
uh, Tom Ingram, you mm-hmm. know, with his, with his mm-hmm. title bid. So it'd be, yeah. it'd be interesting to see. Uh, then who else we got? I forgot. Oh, is that no? It's obviously Ash with with Dan. So it's it's all it's. It's all to play for, and I think it is going to be quite exciting. But I, I, I think you you might have a bit more involved with it by the end of the year, Dan, as, as, yeah. as the battles go on. Yeah, potentially. Like you said, I think from my side, I'm going there to do the best possible job for myself and and and, and the team. Um, you know, I want to win races, I want podiums, I want more success for myself ultimately. Um, but if the opportunity along the way comes to help Ash um, in the right way. Um, and, and the fairway, then, then of course, that's only in our interest to do that. Well, it's like I said, uh, you know, from Fruxton, it's not just as easy as swapping over from any position. You know, there's no point. No. You know, it's got. It can only ever really work if, if he's directly behind me, and there's a gap. Which in touring cars around Silverstone, how often do you see a gap big enough to to roll, roll over like that? So, um, you know, it'll take a little bit of thinking about. Um, but like I said before, you know, we'll certainly something we'll talk about, but. First job, qualifying, uh, put that car on the front row and um, and put ourselves in the best possible position. No, good luck. Well, thanks very much for your time. I know you're you're busy fitting lifts no, and all sorts yeah. of stuff as as your day job, if you like. You're you're not a lift operator, but you 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 fit them, do you? Yeah, we got a, a family business that that does um, maintenance, repair, uh, new lift, new lift installation, uh, modernization. So um, yeah, been on been on site this morning, sort of checking a lift that we installed uh, a few months ago. Um, and then yeah, I'm off to uh, Brands Hatch tomorrow, ready for I look after a young lad called Marcus Flack in GB3. Uh, okay. He races he races for Douglas, so he's got GB3 ahead of him this weekend, so that should be good. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of weeks, we'll get to Silverstone and, um, yeah, do my bit. Well, good luck. Good luck. I hope I hope we'd see you with another driver of the day. So, remember, everybody, make sure you download the BTCC app. Make sure you get involved with the conversation and uh, get your votes in. If you, if you fancy voting for Dan, I'm sure he'd be quite happy if he has a, a good, successful end of the season. <laughs> I will indeed. That'd be great. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you.